Shook, who was the owner of Shook Auto, and this would have been, uh, let me see how I, I get this set back. It's Dave Davis, and yeah, it's David's cousin. Their, their moms were sisters. Randy Shook uh, was the owner of Shook Auto. He passed away at the age of 70, 71, with a massive heart attack. So uh, we extend our sympathies to all of the Millers that are here and members of that family. So please remember that. Keeping up with the Miller side of things, uh, there is a, it says a little cutie is on the way. Uh -huh. and, and, you know, normally this is a baby shower, but they're calling it a spring. Okay. <laughs> but, yes, but this is for Sydney and uh, the upcoming birth. And uh, this will be October the 7th at 10 a.m. at the New Philadelphia Church. And uh, this is, there's a lot of things on here. We're not going to go over all of them, but I will hang this back there and we'll give the information to Barb. I love this. Probably won't do any good next time we get the paint So anyway, um, it will be on October the 7th, 10 a.m. I'll hang this up there. Please get the information you need. So that's, that's enough of that. Uh, let me see what else have I got. Wanted to update you a little bit on Mark Weaver. Um, I wasn't going to do it here, but I, I got up to class late, so. Um, Shell sent this to uh, Brenda last night. After watching Mark struggle to breathe, and he looked up at the clock several times, this afternoon, this is from yesterday, asked him what he had seen, and he said, blue skies. Then I asked him if he'd seen any bright light, and he said, yes. And then I asked him if Jesus was calling him home, he said, yes. And he is so tired and ready to go to meet Jesus, so we all released him to go meet Jesus. They started comfort care last night at 7.15, uh, and he slept restfully during the night, and he was still sleeping this morning when she all uh, texted friends again this morning. So uh, please remember to pray for that family. Uh, uh, Shane Weaver was in charge of the group that did the work in here, and that's their son. So. Uh, we ask for prayers for him and all our families. It's going to be a really rough, rough time. So uh, I think that's about all that I've got. Oh, I know another one. Um, in the bulletin it says Pat Beachy, this is Jeanette's cousin, uh, has stage four cancer. She passed away uh, Wednesday and uh, didn't, have, didn't know that until the bulletin was already out. So um, that is Jeanette's cousin. I'm sure we'll get some, some uh, details on that. A lot of other things in the bulletin. Please no. get one of those and let's go over uh, all those things that we are doing. If I forgot something really important. No, okay. That's a good thing. Um, do you ever wonder about the wonder of our God? You know, the wonderful, the great things that happen to us. And uh, Psalm 147 says, Praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to our God. How pleasant and fitting to praise Him. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the exiles of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and, and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars and calls each of them by name. Think about that. That's a lot of stars. That's a lot of names. We can't come up with, we can't keep telling people the same thing. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. The Lord sustains the humble, but casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make music to our God on the harp. He covers the sky with clouds. He supplies the earth with rain and makes grass grow. On the hills, he provides food for the cattle and for the young ravens when they call. His pleasure is not in the strength of a horse, nor his delight in the legs of a man. The Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope in his unfailing love. Extol the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion, for he strengthens the bars of your gates and blesses your people with you. He grants peace to your borders and satisfies you with the finest of wheat. He sends his command to the earth, his word runs swiftly. He spreads the snow like wool and scatters the frost like ashes. 
he hurls down his tail like feathers. He who can withstand, who can withstand his icy blast? He sends his word and melts them. He stirs up his breeze and the waters flow. He has revealed his word to Jacob, his law and decrees to Israel. He has done this for no other nation. They do not know he has laws. Praise the Lord. supernatural joy and gladness even during difficult circumstances. Lord, you are my 
Christ's love for us, for his sacrifice for us. We're thankful that we have the ability to assemble together as one body this morning, as one people before you, to memorialize Christ. Father, without him, what do we have? No works that we can produce here on earth can save us. No amount of wealth can buy our salvation. But through Christ's gift, we have hope. Father, we're thankful for these memorial items that we have to partake. The bread that represents Christ's broken body. Fruit of the vine that represents the blood of the new covenant. Which we are sanctified. Yeah. Father, be with us as we reflect now. other and the work of the church and evangelism, but also to those outside, Father, who are in the us as we have the opportunity to give back this morning.
if you're using a songbook, please mark 945. That will be a song of invitation, 945. But it will be on the screen, so we'd like to keep it there. Would you please stand as we sing this next song? <laughs>
that, that God is singling you out as being a very fortunate individual because he is blessing you so. It's not something that Jesus says in his sermon here. He doesn't say it flippantly or in some kind of a meaningless way. It, it, it means something, and it's important. Hopefully we realize that. But so far, Jesus has said in his Sermon on the Mount that it is a blessed thing to, number one, be spiritually poor. Blessed are the poor in spirit. That is, when someone comes to themselves and realizes their spiritual condition. They come to God with empty hands. They come to God as spiritual beggars, not having anything in and of themselves to bring to the table. Who then receive by God's grace all of the riches of heaven. And that's a blessed thing for us. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Jesus has also said that it is a blessed thing to mourn over our spiritual condition. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. It's a blessed thing to mourn over our spiritual condition. That is, we are grieved when we see ourselves for who we really are. We're single. We mess up. We don't meet God's standard. We have fallen from his glory. We see ourselves. We see our guilt before God. And Jesus turns the tables and said, that's a blessed thing. That you come to that realization and you mourn over it. It is from this point of grief or this mourning that we're able to get out of our own way and go on to receive the perfect eternal comfort that comes only from our Heavenly Father. And it's from this point, a point of spiritual bankruptcy, we might say, a point of spiritual mourning, that Jesus then goes on to say that it is the meek who are blessed. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And again, this concept of meekness is what our lesson is primarily going to revolve around today. We want to understand what meekness means. We want to understand how do we then go on to practice it, not just what it means, but how do I apply it to my life and do it? What are some of the obstacles that we might face or I might face individually that might prevent me or hinder me from practicing meekness or make it difficult? And with that, some things we might need to avoid. We want to see also how our previous two Beatitudes that Jesus has spoken about lead into this. We've said at the onset of this series, that this is a, a progression, uh, going from spiritual bankruptcy to being completely fulfilled in Christ and then being able to do what Christians ought to do because of that. I will mention briefly at the onset of this sermon that I don't have a firm answer as to what inheriting the earth means exactly. That's, that's a thing that has been hotly disputed and debated by theological scholars, of which I am not one, for years and years and years. And so I cannot be completely dogmatic on what inheriting the earth means. There are those who believe that this is strictly in reference to a spiritual reality, uh, that those who believe, believe gain a sort of peace that allows them to just keep on going in this world. There are those who believe that this is in reference to a time after the Lord comes, in which God uh, will dwell with his people in a new physical earth. There are those who don't know what it means, but they know it can't mean that. But there's a, there's a lot of different opinions about what inheriting the earth means in the new heavens and the new earth and that sort of a debate. We're not going to get into all of that this morning. Our focus is primarily on that weakness aspect. Because that's what's required to end up going wherever this is. And that's ultimately what we want to do. I'm of the opinion that whatever that means doesn't really matter that much to me, personally. I don't control the future and what God does with his creation. I don't have any say in that. I only know that whatever this is in reference to, it's going to be very good. I know that God's going to be there. And I know that I want to be there. And I want for you to be there too. And if we can agree on that, we can move on from this point. I know whatever it is, wherever it is, it's only promised to the meek. And so back to the focus of our lesson. What is meekness? Are you a, are you a meek individual? Am I a meek individual? How do we know? What does it look like? Well, meekness means simply 
humility. To be humble. It also means to be under control. It means to be selfless. Meekness also implies because of that, that you have a freedom from malice or the desire to take vengeance. Or as we say, it even. It means that you're not self-seeking. You're not looking out purely for number one. It's a characteristic and a way of living that is also very contrary to how the rest of the world thinks and acts. That's one thing that really tips off if somebody's a meek individual is the fact that they're not thinking and acting like most of the rest of the world thinks and acts. But it is understandable from a worldly perspective why someone would not exhibit meekness. From a purely worldly, worldly standpoint to worldly view, it makes sense not to be meek, not to be humble, and to always look out for number one. Why would you seek to be meek in this world and in this life? Let's try this again. Why should you be meek in this world and in this life? And all that you can accomplish and accumulate, all that's just for yourself. Why, why shouldn't you be selfish in that way? Why be meek if none of this really matters? Why shouldn't we value and pursue our own desires, our own interests, our own preferences, our own feelings, etc., above those of others or anything else? Why shouldn't we? If this is all there is. Practicing meekness, in fact, makes no sense from a purely worldly perspective. And in fact, practicing meekness could end up making your life worse. Have you considered that? Being the meek and mild individual can make your life worse. This world is all about survival of the fittest. You've heard that. The fittest, the smartest, the strongest. Like mates, right? You've heard all those kinds of phrases. And since that's the case, and since a lot of people think that way, <clears throat> a lot of people will do whatever they can to get you to stay on top. Whether that involves taking advantage of people or tearing down the image of others and make yourself stand out as being superior, we call that slander. Whether that involves stealing or cheating or acts of violence or whatever the case may be, from a purely worldly perspective, meekness makes no sense. It is to the meek, though, that Jesus says that they are blessed and will go on to inherit the earth. Being meek, being humble, is not the easiest thing in the world to do. Would we, would we agree with that? Sometimes it's really hard not to allow pride and other things pop up, and those things get in the way of us being meek. And so we want to talk now about what are some things that get in the way of being meek. We want to be meek. Jesus tells us to be meek. We know what that looks like, but it's not so easy. If we understand what those pitfalls are, what those things that get in the way are, maybe we have a better chance of avoiding them or working around them or, or getting through them. And so what are some obstacles to meet you? How difficult you suppose it would be to practice meekness if in your heart you're just unsettled or maybe you're grieved or impoverished a few of the things that Jesus has brought up already in his sermon you know spiritually poor spiritually mourning how difficult is it then to be meek if those things are unsettled in your life? <coughs> physically speaking that would be difficult especially if you think about the circumstances that were put on those uh, those individuals that Jesus is addressing. Remember all the Roman occupation and the oppression from their spiritual leaders and all those sort of things. Don't you think it would be hard to say, well, I'm just going to be humble about all this and go about my very way? You might want to get even. You want things to be made right. You might want to take things into your own hands and make things right. And spiritually speaking, it's pretty much the same story. It's hard to be meek if it feels like your life is a complete mess and you have no control or your heart might be broken. It's hard to be meek when those things are in play. When life feels unjust, especially when life feels unjust, meekness is not usually a top priority for us. We want to make things right, even if we do it in the wrong way sometimes. 
There's all sorts of obstacles to meekness and things that inhibit our, or, and things that might inhibit or outright prevent us from being useful or effective in God's kingdom. The things that inhibit us from being meek also inhibit us from being useful and effective in God's kingdom. And these are things that we're all familiar with, things like pride. Pride, the, the antithesis of meekness. We're all familiar with that. We've all dealt with it. Sometimes we still deal with it, if we're honest. Pride being that spirit within us that pops up when we're offended. It usually rears its ugly head then. When, when we're offended, somebody's said or done something to upset us, we're quick to put up that, that wall of defense in the shape of pride. Pride is that spirit that causes us to look down on others and to look at ourselves more highly than we ought to. It's that spirit within us that asks, why should I have to deal with that? Why should I be responsible? That's not my job. That's not my... What are you asking me for? We're familiar with that. It's the source of great deals of disputes and fights and violence. You see people just knocking each other out on the street. Pride's involved. It's a part of that. <clears throat> Pride is the thing that often causes us to put a yoke of our own expectations around the necks of others. And when those expectations are not met, we are then empowered to come down on them. Pride's ugly and it's everywhere. The Bible says this about pride in Proverbs 13.10. By pride comes nothing but strife. You know why there's fighting? Because there's pride involved. But with well advised is wisdom. If you think about your life, you observe your life, and you take account of that, and you notice that there's a, a notable amount of conflict and disputes and those sort of things in your life and in your relationships, you can bet that pride is a component of why that's happening. You, you can bet your bottom dollar that pride is involved somewhere if there's constantly disputes and fighting in your life and in your relationships. But that's not all. Pride is a big one. It's a primary one. But there are other things, like perhaps a lack of self-control. A lack of self-control can inhibit meekness taking place. That is, what you say and what you do is not subject to the will of God, or maybe even worse. No, well, not worse than that. But in addition to that, maybe you don't have control over your own life. You're just completely out of control. Maybe your life is more reactionary than responsive. For example, perhaps you're wronged by someone, and so you lash out impulsively instead of stopping to think about it and deal with the problem as God would have you to do it. We have the obstacle of selfishness. Selfishness can be the result of many things. Maybe it's the result of having a sense of need. I really do need this thing, and it's not being dealt with, so I've got to look out for me, and I have to exclude everybody else because of selfishness. Uh, perhaps selfish, selfishness has a sense of superiority. I deserve this, whatever this is, more than they do. I've worked harder, I've worked longer, it, it should be mine. Meekness isn't any part of that. What about a selfishness brought on by past experiences, and maybe some of those might be traumatic experiences, where you say, if I don't look after me, no one else will. And so you have a selfishness out of necessity, so to speak. <clears throat> but regardless of the cause, it still inhibits our ability to be meek. We have the obstacle of fear. Have you considered fear being an obstacle to you practicing humility? Fear and humility. Perhaps it's the fear of missing out. Call that FOMO. Fear of missing out. And you, there's a great example of that that's coming up here in another month. Black Friday Christmas shopping. You have people fearful that they're not going to get what's coming to them, what they want, what they, right? You've seen it. And how do people treat each other on Black Friday, Friday Christmas shopping where you've seen it? They trample each other sometimes to death. Is there meekness there? No. And I don't know. You have a fear of missing out that drives you to be selfish and humble. It's not how you describe that situation. <clears throat> I don't see a lot of us trampling other people on Black Friday. It's not our thing, right? 
But here's one that might be a little bit more familiar. Relatable fear of being hurt. Or maybe being hurt again and again. Fear of being hurt can really hinder our ability to practice meekness. And it's understandable why we might have a fear of being hurt, because being hurt stinks. It doesn't feel good. It hurts. I will say this, it's a healthy thing to have healthy boundaries. We all need to have healthy boundaries. <coughs> but boundaries can quickly become impenetrable fortresses. And those fortresses can grow up to have attack towers if we're not careful. Boundaries and the reasons why we have those boundaries need to be assessed fairly regularly. We might find that we have them up for no reason, or we might find that we have them up for a good reason, but we do need to ask ourselves regularly why we have them, and if, they're if we continue to need them. <clears throat> but because we are fearful, we often put up walls of defense. Sometimes those walls are designed to hurt back those who are coming in. Think of the cute little hedgehog. You ever seen a hedgehog? The funny looking little creatures. They're, they're fairly, fairly tame. They don't really go out to attack anybody. But when they feel threatened, what do they do? <laughs> Rachel does. Go ahead. That's right. They've got those spikes you gotta look out for. And they'll curl up on themselves so that nothing can get into them. And then those little spikes poke out. And so they don't go out of their way to try and hurt you. But if you get too close, what happens? You're going to get hurt. And sometimes we can be kind of like a hedgehog. I'm not going to go out of my way to cause you pain, but if you get close enough to me, it's going to hurt you. Sometimes along the, those same lines, we not only build up walls of defense, we create our fortress. But we dig emotional moats filled with waters of distrust that prevent close relationships. You haven't done anything offensive at this point. You're not going out to try and hurt people. But you've put up walls and you've put up boundaries that are impenetrable, that nobody can get close to you. Nobody can get close. And it prevents those close relationships. And maybe you take it one step further and you scrutinize those who would come here. And so you keep them at a healthy distance, and it keeps you safe. Sometimes those boundaries need to be put up. Sometimes people are not safe. That's fair. But I will say this. It's incredibly difficult to build meaningful relationships, let alone build up the kingdom. When we wage a war, even if it's a cold war, with each other, with our brethren. It's incredibly difficult, more likely impossible, to practice that meekness with your fellow brethren or anyone else for that matter if the relationships are cut off and hindered because we're so afraid that we might get hurt. We got to be discerning about this. We got to we have to be introspective. We got to think about the situations, think about the boundaries that we have, so that they do not inhibit personal. Relational growth over the growth of the kingdom. Just imagine if Jesus were this way. If he allowed these sorts of things, fear of being hurt, if he allowed things like pride, those selfishness, those, imagine if Jesus stood that way. What would this world look like? What would this together look like? I don't want to think about that. Instead, we look at Jesus and we see a man who had no pride. None. He lived under total control of the will of his father. He was selfless, utterly selfless. He lived without fear. And he was one of the, he was the most humble man to ever walk the face of the earth. And we can thank God for that. We want to be more like Jesus, right? Gotta to look to his example, and sometimes it's hard to, to follow in those footsteps. But it's our calling. There are also some requirements. <coughs> Requirements of meekness. If we are to be meek, number one, we need to know and accept the truth. If you want, if you say today, all right, I want to be a meek person, 
I want to be humble. I want to learn to do that better. And hopefully we can all say that. We have to be able to know and accept the truth. There are many who know the truth but don't accept it. We need both. We need to know and accept what is true about us, especially spiritually speaking, if meekness is to come about. The truth that says, you know what, I, I do sin. I sin sometimes. I'm sinning. I have pride sometimes. I'm ashamed of that. I say and do things I know I should not do. That's true about me. I don't say and don't do things I know I should. Also, sometimes true about me. We need to be able to recognize and accept this is objectively true. I am not always who I am supposed to be. If you want to be me, we have to come to that, that realization and accept that. We have to also recognize that apart from Jesus, I'm spiritually poor. And in fact, I have great cause for mourning because of it and because of my sin. I have to realize and accept that I come to God with empty hands and as a beggar. I come to God with my guilt. We don't have to stay with that guilt, but I come to Him with my guilt. And I have nothing in and of myself to stay about. If I only, if I not only know but accept these realities of myself, what's left for me to be prideful about? Think about it. If these are, these are objective realities in my life and I accept them, what is there left in me to be prideful about? What then hinders me from truly being me? Not only does the truth help us to come to terms with our spiritual reality, it does something else of equal importance. <clears throat> it helps us to put things into proper perspective. When we see what's true about us, objectively speaking, it helps us to get a better perspective, not only on ourselves, but on the world around us and on the people we interact with. We can look at ourselves and our neighbors and say, well, if I find myself in this place because of sin, then I know that so-and-so is in the same boat that I am. They, they struggle just like I do. See how that kind of levels the playing field between people? I, I've got problems. You've got them too. And we're working through them. It helps level the playing field. And that's especially important with our interactions with our brethren. That person might be completely blind to the fact that they are in the position that they're in. Or that they do the things that they do. But know for sure that they're in that same position, whether they see it or not. Knowing that they're in it, blind or not, how much more are you inclined to approach them with some degree of humility? Knowing that they're just like you are. Here's something we need to remember, that though we are in Christ, and we are spiritually rich because of that, because of His grace extended to us, and even though in Christ, we're not exactly beggars anymore. We have all that we need in Him. We still keep doing the sorts of things that made us beggars to start with, don't we? we? We still go back to some of those things that we did before we were part of the body of Christ. <coughs> sometimes we still sin. Sometimes we still sin against each other. Sometimes Christians even are blind to their moral failings against one another. And it's the responsibility then of every Christian to practice meekness towards the one who has done wrong. Realizing that each of us are just as guilty as the other. We're all in the same boat. We're on the level playing field. We want to try and give everyone the benefit of the doubt and try to be understanding as much as possible. If correction is needed of some kind, meekness then means that we handle it in a gentle and loving way. We're not trying to bring the hammer down on them, so to speak. We don't need to go on the attack either or try and slander or put them down or undermine them or whatever. That's not the goal. Those who are honest and trying to follow the Lord don't usually require a beat down to get back on the right path. Think about it. You know somebody who's kind of getting off the path a little bit, but you know 
They're doing their best. They're trying to follow in the Lord's footsteps. Do, do they need to too high for them to straighten them out? Or do they need the encouraging word to say, hey, brother, he says, I noticed this. You want to talk about it? We know the appropriate action to take there. There's also the responsibility of the one who has done wrong to be meek enough or humble enough to receive the correction. And if you've ever been on the receiving end of correction, whether it's a church setting or anywhere else, being corrected doesn't feel all that good. It's not comfortable at the very least. <clears throat> and it means that we refrain from going on the defensive as those being corrected. It means we refrain from putting up the walls plugging our ears so that we don't hear what needs to be said. It also means that we receive the correction in a way that was meant to be received. That's what it means for us to be meek on the receiving end. Have you, have you ever said something or done something that received, was received in the totally wrong way, not the way that you meant for it to be received? I imagine all of us that we said and done something that was not received well, and it's not received the way that we intended it to be received. Or maybe the flip side. The flip side. Somebody said something to you, and you didn't receive it well. It's not a great position to be in. It doesn't feel good. But to be meek means that we might need to give those who correct us or say something to us the benefit of the doubt. We might have to say, I heard what you said, brother or sister, so-and-so. I mean, it came across in this way, but I know you better than that, and I trust that's not how you meant it to come across. And so I'm going to receive it in the way that I think you intended it to be received. They may have said something that was completely offensive or, or something not meaning for it to be offensive. And to be me, it says, okay, I, I think I understood what you meant. And I'm going to let whatever offense was tied to that go. It's hard to be humble enough to do that. But that's part of being humble. It can be very hard to combat against our pride or the other problems that hinder meekness. There are many. <clears throat> but it's part of following Jesus and being like him. I hope we can acknowledge that's true and accept that. We need to remain dedicated to practicing his ways, and meekness is one of them. We need to keep the blessings that Jesus has spoken about in the forefront of our minds and allow them to motivate us to keep going. So my question as we close out our lesson this morning is, will you be blessed in your life and in the life to come? Will you be blessed? We must come before God with empty hands and a contrite heart, a broken heart over our sins, and that's not going to happen unless for me. Unless we're humble enough to admit that truth and to accept it. We need to be willing to accept that truth about where we stand apart from Christ, that we can come to Him in faith and be blessed by Him. We need to be cleansed spiritually by His hand. And the Bible talks about this. We turn from pursuing a life focused on ourselves, focused on our sins, and turn to God in faith. Trusting Him and entrusting ourselves to Him. We obey Him out of love for what He's provided for us through Jesus Christ. Namely, the ability for our sins to be washed away. We submit to uniting ourselves with Christ, His death, His burial, His resurrection. And that watery grave of baptism will rise up to a newness of life. See Romans 6, Acts 2, verse 2 to 3. There's a lot of places we could look to for all of that. But just remember, there's nothing magical about the water. But it is where we first begin our journey of meekness with the Lord, towards the Lord, by trusting that God will bless us and trusting Him. Perhaps you've already done this, but you've allowed pride or some other thing to crop up in your life to hinder you from practicing meekness in the way that you should. Sometimes it's hard to see what that thing might be. And it's important to have someone that you trust, who loves you, who will help you see what you might not be able to see yourself. Maybe you know that what that something is, and you need some help or some kind of way to help you grow and get past that. We want to make sure that you have what you need to be successful 
and to continue maturing in your faith. But whatever your needs might be this morning, don't let them go in that. We want to love you and serve you today in any way that we can. If you want to come forward as we stand. <laughs>
thank you for this time that we can come together to worship you and hope that you enjoyed it. Lord, it's, it's more than a pleasure and a privilege for us to worship you, and I thank you for allowing us to have this time. Thank you for your love. Lord, we thank you for Jesus, who came to the earth to teach us how to ask to live and for giving his life for our sins. Lord, most of all, I want to thank you that he's alive and that we can walk with him. Lord, we lift up to those to you um, who are sick and hurting. Lord, with uh, pain in our bodies and, and pain in our emotions. Lord, we just ask you to wrap those in your love and comfort. Thank you, Lord. Keep us safe. Keep us healthy, Lord, in our journeys this week. In Jesus' name, amen.